an assistant professor uh, from uh, of international relations from KMAP University, uh, Christopher Premiano. Uh, he will give us a talk, a uh, lecture on America and uh, the liberal international uh, liberal international order. Thank you, Professor Wang. Uh, it's good to be back virtually uh, at Hua Shida. Um, I was a visiting lecturer at Hua Shida back in 2018. Um, beautiful campus and really enjoyed being there. So although I'm not there in person, it's, it's good to be there virtually. So I will share my screen. Okay, I take it that everyone can see my screen. Let's get started. So I'll be talking one second here. Okay, so I'll be talking about the liberal international order. Um, so I'll talk about this for until 6.10 um, on my time. So uh, Professor Wang, it'll be 8.10 Beijing time. At that, If I go over at that point, please just let me know and I will stop and we'll get to the Q&A session. So this guy over here, John Eikenberry, uh, the key proponent in popularizing, advancing the term, the liberal international order. Uh, these are two of his uh, major books, After Victory, and then Liberal Leviathan. So after victory, focusing on how after a major power war, how does the major power, the victorious side, bring about a peace in the war? Um, is, it a, is it an order that the uh, major power seeks to be aggressive and actively pushing uh, that country's interests? Or does the, it, does the victorious power seek to create a system that will want to have other countries buy into such a system. And so Eikenberry focuses on the differences between the way World War I ended with the way World War II ended. And we'll focus on that today. And that's the system that we still live in, the post-World War II uh, American-led world order. So we'll be focusing on that today. Okay. In terms of IR theories and the liberal international order, so John Eikenberry, he's a liberal internationalist in terms of uh, liberal IR theory. Uh, liberals view the, I, view the LIO concept or LIO, we could say, or liberal international order, very differently how, from a lot of realists view it. And we're going to focus on how John Mearsheimer also views the LIO. Uh, so liberals thinking that it, it exists, that uh, believing in, in the, uh, the notions of it, Whereas realists tending to downplay, some realists, especially John Mearsheimer, tending to downplay this concept of the liberal international order. And then critical theorists would argue, what are we talking about here? What is this liberal international order? This is an order based on the U.S. government seeking to overthrow other governments throughout the world during the Cold War. How can we call such a system a liberal international order? This is a this is a farce. This is ridiculous. So there, and depending on, so therefore, depending on which IR theory one ascribes to, having a very different view regarding the liberal international order. And if I if I could just ask everyone to mute yourself because I'm getting some feedback. So if everyone could just uh, please mute yourself, that'd be great. All right, so liberal internationalism, as we mentioned before, John Eikenberry, key person advancing this term, the liberal international order. And this is what he says are the keys for LIO. World engagement. If we compare the way how the U.S. acted after World War I with the way the, the U.S. acted after World War II, we see some huge differences. After World War I, the U.S. basically decided to turn its back on the international system. Woodrow Wilson proposed this League of Nations concept, but then the U.S. did not join it. That's due to the fact that in America, the U.S. Senate ratifies treaties. And so while the U.S. president proposed the League of Nations, an international organization, the U.S. did not join it because the U.S. Senate rejected it. And during the 1920s, during the 1930s, we see the U.S. turning its back on the international system, whereas at, to, toward the end of World War II in 1944, 1945, the U.S. realizing from the mistakes that it made during the interwar years, 1920s, 1930s, and deciding that the U.S. needs to be engaged in world affairs. So the, for the LIO world engagement, 
especially by the major power, is essential. Multilateralism, not unilateralism. So for multilateralism, if we take a look at all the international institutions that the U.S. created toward the end and after World War II, IMF, World Bank, GATT, which then evolved into WTO, uh, NATO, uh, all these uh, all these other U- the UN obviously. So all these other all these multilateral uh, institutions engaging in multilateralism, not about the U.S. deciding to rule on its own. Openness. So for uh, Eikenberry argues that uh, openness, access to trade, access to other countries' markets, that is key for the survival of such a system. That uh, liberal economic openness is essential for uh, for the liberal international order, a key component of it. A rules-based system, rule of law. So with international organizations, we see rules. If a country has a dispute with another country, a trade dispute, what do they do? The one country brings it to the WTO because the WTO is a rules-based organization at allowing for the advancement of world trade. So a rules-based system is essential for the LIO. And then democracy. Demo- in order- no, one so, if you can, if you can please mute yourself, that would be great. Uh, so democracy. Um, in order, it, and, uh, Professor, look, can you mute uh, people? So this way we're not hearing them. Um, so uh, democracies. So, so Eikenberry arguing that democracies are essential for a liberal international order. If the leader, if the main power, if the world's hegemon is not a democracy, then it's going to be very difficult for the liberal international order to keep on. Uh, so democracy is a key component of the liberal international order. All right, so let's go over some context here uh, for the liberal international order. So as we mentioned before, that after a major power war, the victorious side has to decide, how do we, de- how do we deal? How do we treat the side that lost? If we compare these years over here, 1919, 1945, 1989, uh, we see very different outcomes. Okay? So 1919, Woodrow, the big three, U.S., Woodrow Wilson, France, Clemenceau, UK, Lloyd George. We see very we see significant differences in how those well, how the US with Wilson and how the UK and France wanted to deal with Germany after World War I. For Woodrow Wilson, his main objective was to create this international organization that we mentioned before, the League of Nations, which would solve international problems, which would deal with collective. <laughs> So, uh, this is like the fifth time I'm asking, so can, ple- can people please mute themselves? <laughs> so 1919, we see uh, the U.S. with Woodrow Wilson wanted to create this international organization uh, that would advance world peace, that would deal with, with problems of international security. And the other side, Lloyd George and Clemenceau were not interested in that. Instead, wanting to punish Germany uh, for Germany's role in World War I. Woodrow Wilson had to go along with that, had to go along with Clemenceau and Lloyd George in punishing Germany in order to get them to go along with his League of Nations. And so we see here that in the Paris Peace Conference, the Treaty of Versailles, reflecting very much the views of Lloyd George and uh, and Woodrow Wilson. Excuse me, Lloyd George and uh, Clemenceau of France. 1945, after World War II, we see the U.S. and even in 1944, toward the end of World War II, the U.S. creating the Bret- at the Bretton Woods Conference, the IMF, the World Bank, realizing that the mistakes that were made during the 1920s, 1930s, in which the world's hegemon, the U.S., 
did not provide for global public goods. It did not address the economic crises going on in Italy, in, in Germany, um, and then how that led to the rise of fascism. It did not provide for the U.S. in 1920s, 1930s, did not provide for global public goods regarding security. And so toward the end of World War II, the U.S. realized that it needs to create these institutions to prevent something like another world war from happening again. And so what does the U.S. do? The U.S. holds this Bretton Woods Conference in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, in which the IMF, the World Bank, are created to deal with financial and economic problems. Then 1945, the UN is created to deal with political problems, security issues. Yeah. Also in 1945, the US, this realizing from the way how Germany was punished after World War I by the UK and France, not to punish Germany or Japan that way. Instead, to rebuild, to have those countries surrender unconditionally and to rebuild those countries as U.S. allies, establishing military bases there, making sure that those countries will be on the U.S.'s side in the years to come. So if we compare how the outcome, the way World War I came to an end with the way World War II came to an end, we see fundamental differences. And then also, in terms of the world's hegemon, the U.S., viewing its responsibilities very differently. Whereas in the, after World War I, the interwar years, the U.S. turning its back on the international system toward the end of World War II, and then in the post-World War II years, we see the U.S. playing a fundamental role in world affairs. And then with 1989, when, when the Cold War came to an end, in terms of how the U.S., and this has received a lot of attention, especially in recent years, in terms of how the U.S. viewed uh, the defeated Soviet Union, uh, and, and thus Russia, uh, viewing it as not this former great power, but instead this defeated country. And so instead of uh, arranging an economic package similar to what the U.S. arranged, for, like say, Germany or Japan, uh, the U.S. having the IMF, uh, implement uh, basically very uh, harsh, uh, austere measures uh, in terms of neoliberalism, uh, which is which is very much the opposite of what the U.S. did in terms of rebuilding the economies of Germany and Japan after World War II. Okay, now domestic politics are key for orders. So if we compare, say. The U.S.'s vision of a global order versus China's vision of a global order, we see very different views, and which largely come from looking inside the black box. So the U.S. president at the time of World War II, up until the very end of World War II when he died, FDR, FDR uh, in the U.S. domestically creating this new deal with these public works projects, and then so fundamentally changing the U.S. economy. FDR wanted to do something like that for the world. And basically, Eikenberry argues like, you know, having this new deal for the world uh, in which trying to create this fundamentally different, fundamentally new system uh, in terms of trying to bring about a lasting peace. So dom domestic political conditions of the, the hegemon are key for how that country wants to project its influence, project its power globally. And we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, Orders always have challenges. So, for example, like after World War II, the U.S.'s main competitor, main rival, obviously the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union contesting the U.S.'s vision of a, of a world order. And in terms of the huge economic power, huge advantage that the U.S. had in the aftermath of World War II, um, numerous countries in, in Europe completely devastated uh, just in terms of the uh, physical layout of, of the countries, um, whereas the U.S., besides Hawaii, um, no problem at all, not being damaged. And so the U.S.'s economic output, economic production, key for allowing the U.S. Uh, to be in this position that it was, this hegemonic position. Now, Eikenberry argues that the liberal international order, he argues that it's like a shopping mall. You can go in. You can look around, you can sign up for certain institutions, certain international institutions, 
you want to be part of the WTO, you could join it. You don't want to be part of it. You don't have to join it. Eikenberry and liberals are arguing that why do these, why do states join the, uh, the LIO? Why do these states join these institutions like the WTO? Because it's in their interest. It's better for them to be in it than to not be in it. If there's a trade dispute, if a country is a WTO member, country can bring that trade dispute to the WTO. So these institutions that were created in the aftermath of World War II, you have many states, small states, uh, buying into these institutions, wanting to be part of them, because viewing it at that it's better to be in these institutions than not be in these institutions. And so for the U.S., these are the key components uh, of this international rules-based system that sought to advance. International organizations, as we mentioned before, 1944, Bretton Woods Conference, the IMF, World Bank being created. 1948, GATT, or the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which then evolved into the WTO. Uh, NATO, 1949, like Marshall Plan. Um, so international organizations, which again are based, it's a rules-based system, trade and security. And so this is how he, this is how Eikenberry describes LIO or the liberal international order. It's easy to join and hard to overturn. As mentioned before, states can join the IMF, the World Bank, um, WTO, very easy to join these institutions. But in terms of overturning this system, that would require huge costs by a challenger. I mean, we see the Chinese government creating the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, um, a, a multilateral organization, doing things bilaterally with Belt and Road Initiative. Um, but in order, but if China or Russia, for example, were trying to overturn this system, it would be very costly to do that. And that's why Eikenberg thinks this system will endure. So why, as we've mentioned before, why have states joined LIO? Uh, because they're benefiting from this, because they know that it's better to be part of the system than not be part of the system. So uh, there's tremendous debate recently about like, is LIO over with? And we're gonna focus on John Mearsheimer a little bit. Um, so these are some examples of how secure uh, the world's head, well, if we want to refer to the U.S. as the world's hegemon, but this is how uh, some examples demonstrating about how secure the U.S. and the liberal international order is. Wars in Mideast, Iraq, and greater Central Asia, Afghanistan, huge costs uh, to the U.S. Treasury, trillions of dollars. The failure of Trump. Uh, and so these are things that w for another country, uh, could totally devastate that country's economy. Um, but the U.S. still in a strong position despite these huge failures. And so uh, with the liberal international order, the, less, the West leading the way, during the 1970s and 80s and the 1990s, we see many countries of the world democratizing, moving away from authoritarian rule and instead engaging in electoral democracy, participatory democracy, becoming democracies. And then toward the end uh, of the Cold War, and then at the end of the Cold War in 1989, there was talk that liberal democracy is the only game in town. Fukuyama's book, uh, The End of History and the Last Man. That's during World War II, fascism had been defeated. Then with the end of the, so with, with the, end of the Cold War, communism had de been defeated. And then the last man, democracy and capitalism, that's how much of it was framed, especially in the U.S., Western states, uh, with modernization theory. So long as the U.S. West engages other countries with trade, this is going to result in wealth creation in those countries. This is going to result in those countries becoming democracies. Yeah. And the, that, was, that was the argument that was made for why the U.S. should engage China. And in the 1990s, as George W. Bush said when he was campaigning for president, uh, trade freely with China and time is on our side. Uh, now, what he meant by that was that as long as the U.S. trades with China, modernization theory is going to kick in. That wealth, there's going to be wealth creation in China. This is going to result in the rise of the middle class. 
and people in China will want to have a democracy. At least that was the common thinking in America in the 1990s. Okay, so in terms of this order, this post-World War II liberal international order, um, Eikenberry argued that's different from the previous orders because of this emphasis on equality, that because other countries can buy into such a system, that such a system is based more on consent than coercion. Uh, sometimes there's coercion by, by the leading power, U.S. Uh, overthrowing other governments during the Cold War, many governments during the Cold War, uh, 2003, with U.S. Over, uh, going to war uh, without U.N. Security Council approval for the Iraq War in 2003. So sometimes you see the U.S. acting unilaterally. Um, but in other times, though, that the Eikenberry and other liberals will argue that this rules-based system uh, prevailing. Now, during the Cold War, Eikenberry argues that the liberal international order was not a global order, it was not for the world. Uh, instead, it was a Western-based order uh, in this bipolar world between the U.S. and the Soviet Union competing for global hegemony. Then after the Cold War, that's when Eikenberry argues that the LIO went from this Western-centered world to this global order, to this global system. And as mentioned before, uh, and this is what people who are uh, part of the critical theory camp in IR would point out. People who are critical theorists would say, look at all the governments that the U.S. overthrew during the Cold War, whether it be like in Guatemala, in Iran, so many other countries. Um, and so some estimates having that the U.S. attempted regime change uh, 72 times during that time period, during the Cold War. So Eikenberry argues that during the Cold War, the liberal international order, as we said before, was this Western system and not clearly out there for the entire world. But then with the end of the Cold War, then it became clear for the entire world, this liberal international order, and the U.S. sought to apply it to the world instead of having it limited, limited in this geographical area of the West during the Cold War. Now, these are some terms that were used by liberal IR scholars uh, to describe the order during the Cold War. So like regime theory, the importance of uh, like Bob Cohen, others emphasizing the importance of international institutions. Democratic peace, uh, for democratic peace, the idea that two countries, their democracies do not go to war with each other. Okay? Democratic peace. Uh, epistemic communities. Um, having like uh, like the UNESCO, other international organizations, um, and the uh, advancements that, that they made. Uh, so these were terms during the Cold War that were used. And then after the Cold War, this term, which Eikenberry has really popularized, the liberal international order. Now, some, as mentioned before, some argue that LIO is under fire, that... Uh, it's under tremendous pressure, tremendous strain, or some argue that it's already, it's collapsed. So in terms of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, some people argue that that dealt a huge blow to Lyle uh, because we see here that the country uh, that was claiming, like, you know, embracing, pushing neoliberalism, uh, this Washington consensus on other countries uh, was on the verge of economic collapse. Whereas like in China, not one bank collapsed because of the strong regulation um, of the banking sector uh, in China. Uh, and so the 2008 financial crisis did huge damage to the US led world order. And then the Chinese government feeling that, look look at what's going on in the US. That this, uh, numerous scholars have argued that the Chinese government really felt empowered to push their agenda and feeling that their system is superior to the American system. So Fareed Zakaria has said this about uh, the liberal international order, paraphrasing uh, Voltaire on, on the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, it was never as liberal, as international, or as orderly as it is now nostalgically remembered, uh, described, excuse me. And in 2016, we really see Western voters in the two countries that were that have been the 
two main countries in creating uh, this post-war international order, the U.S. and the U.K., voters in those countries decided to turn their backs on the system that they were essential in creating. So in 2016, with Brexit, also in 2016, with the election of Trump. Um, so we see there being tremendous discontent with the liberal international order in 2016 based on uh, election results in the U.S. and the U.K. And if we take a look, Trump was not for the liberal international order. Uh, these are some of the key elements of the liberal international order, and we see strong opposition by Trump to these. Immigration. For those of you who might remember, the first speech that Trump gave was about this, this rant going against uh, Mexican immigrants. Uh, an open system for trade or exchange of goods. Trump is for tariffs. Alliances. Trump was very critical of NATO, other alliances. Constitutional rights, not a support of that. And then international organizations, international law. So Trump being very much against the key components of the liberal international order. Now, democracies have not been doing well lately with the rise of populism in the US, in the UK, in Brazil, in Turkey, in India. Uh, we'll, we'll see in the, in, in the coming weeks if Le Pen in France gets elected. Um, so democracies have been struggling. If we take a look at the data from Freedom House, Freedom House, uh, which measures uh, countries' level of freedom, every year since 2004, there has been a decline globally in the level of freedom. So democracies have been struggling very much since 2004. And some argue that this is a, a bad sign for the liberal international order. Russia and China, both those two states, uh, Russia and China oppose U.S. hegemony um, and therefore posing this challenge for the U.S. and the liberal international order. Now, the key question, though, is do these two countries, do China and Russia have a vision and a viable alternative to Lyo? As you mentioned before, the reason why China created the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in 20. 2014 or 2015, I can't remember the year. Um, but uh, the reason was because of its discontent with its lack of voting power in the IMF, in these Western-dominated international institution, financial institutions. The, re the Chinese government was not in that position in the 1990s because it did not have the wealth. The reason why China created Belt and Road in 2013, and when Xi Jinping gave that speech here in Kazakhstan, at that point, in 2013, China had the ability, the wherewithal, to implement a Belt and Road Initiative for the world. In the 1990s, the Chinese government was not in that position. Okay. Um, but in turn, as we mentioned before, that quote from Eikenberry about the liberal international order, easy to join, difficult to overturn. So even if China and Russia have this vision for uh, providing an alternative to the current U.S.-led order, it's going to be very costly for these two states. And so in terms of the anxiety of regarding this end, possible end for the liberal international order, and where does it come from? It, it's in the West. In non-Western states, there's not a whole lot of talk about you know, the, the fear of the end of the liberal international order. So in terms of the fear of the end of the liberal international order uh, coming from uh, Western states, Western countries. So Eikenberry argued this uh, two years ago. He argued that in 20 years from now, the, the following will still be around. The alliance system between the U.S. and Europe, specifically NATO, okay? And then the, bio, the bilateral system like U.S. and Japan, U.S. and South Korea, uh, U.S. and other countries in the Asia Pacific. He argues that in, 20, so in 2040, that system will still uh, be in existence. The power of the US dollar, that that will still be the world's currency and therefore it will show the strength of the US. Trade regimes will still be key. So the WTO, as we mentioned before, WTO 
key uh, economic, key international organization, and probably the leading international financial institution regarding world trade, that will still be key. That will still be around. And democracies uh, will be locked in. Keep in mind, for the liberal international order to exist, there need to be democracies. All right, here we go. Moving on to realism now, in particular, offensive realism. Right? So this is John Mearsheimer. So let's take a look at Mearsheimer's take on the liberal international order. So as we mentioned before, with Eikenberry, Eikenberry arguing that during the Cold War, uh, the liberal that the liberal international order is applied to the West. Uh, then after the Cold War, that's when it went global. Eikenberry, excuse me, Mearsheimer argues that LAO was created at the end of the Cold War. That prior to that, during the Cold War, it did not exist. During the Cold War, there was a, this different system. And this is what he argues with the two key realist orders during that time period. The one was an American-led system, and the other one was a Soviet-led system or Soviet-led order. And those were not international orders. Uh, according to so keep on, it's according to Mearsheimer. Uh, because for Mearsheimer, in order for there to be an international order, all the key actors, all the key states must be part of that order. And so Mearsheimer arguing that, uh, that NATO, uh, the key Western security institution, and the EU, he argues that both of those international institutions are based on realism. Realism explains why those institutions were created. Because it was about security for both the EU and NATO during the Cold War. And that's why they created, that's why Western states created NATO and the EU. And then for the Soviet Union with its Warsaw Pact. 1989, uh, the, U the Soviet led order collapsed into the Cold War and the US won. And so at that point, that's when the US seeks to create this international system in terms of spreading democracy everywhere. So keep on, this is for Mearsheimer. Because at that point, there was this unipolar moment um, that there was no other power that could rival the US. And so during the Cold War for Mearsheimer, the US was not engaging in things like regime change in terms of democracy promotion because its main concern was about security issues. But then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, the US, Mearsheimer argues, then could do very stupid things. And things like engaging in trying to spread democracy everywhere, whether it's like by the barrel of a gun in the case of Iraq. And then with EU and NATO expansion. So for those of you who've been following uh, the crisis, the uh, Russia's war in Ukraine, uh, you, you, if you've been following this, if you've been following Mearsheimer, you know that Mearsheimer is very critical of the U.S. Uh, in its desire for NATO expansion eastward. Uh, and Mearsheimer has gone into detail about this during the Q&A session. We can go into more detail about that, that particular aspect if you're interested. Okay, so for Mearsheimer, this liberal international order can only exist in a unipolar world, in a world order in which there's only one major power, uh, because if there's this bipolar system, then the U.S. is going to be focused on the other major power, and it's not going to be doing things like engaging in democracy promotion or trying to you know, go to other go to war with other countries, like with the case of Iraq, to try to spread democracy in the Middle East, because the main focus will be containing or hindering the other main rival. So he refers to that, that time period, 1990 to 04, as the golden years, as the high point, the apex of the liberal international order. And as we mentioned before, since 2004, uh, global freedom has been declining every year, according to Freedom House. For Mearsheimer, <clears throat> the liberal international order bound to fail. Um, it was only a matter of time for Mearsheimer. And so, because with the liberal inter international order, uh, the U.S. does not engage in realism, does not focus on realism, is not guided by realism. 
things like power politics, the balance of power. Because as we said before, there's no other country that the U.S. is worried about. And so the U.S., according to Mearsheimer, can engage in these stupid things, uh, be very arrogant and do things that it would not be doing if there were another country that the U.S. was concerned about. Okay. And then, so for uh, the LIO, Liberal International Order, uh, is one in which the main player is a liberal democracy, uh, and that country has three main goals. So as we said before, promoting democracy, capitalism, and advancing international organizations. And so for Mearsheimer on the Bush administration, arguing like after uh, 9-11, because early on, Bush had talked about the importance of having a humble foreign policy. Early on, Bush is, you would think like Bush is, was uh, reflecting a rather realist foreign policy in terms of uh, limiting military engagement. Then after 9-11, um, it was, and then going on this like democracy crusade uh, with the start of the Iraq war, and then with in Bush's um, 2005 uh, second inaugural speech, talking about promoting freedom everywhere. So 04, 05, that's when we start to see uh, the liberal international order in decline. Um, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, 2008 financial crisis, euro crisis, uh, all demonstrate how the liberal international order for Mearsheimer has not been performing well. And uh, Mearsheimer argues um, right, with the rise of China and Russia, uh, uh, rise of China and Russian aggression, uh, key for why the liberal international order is not doing well. That the U.S. Um, is not uh, for, for Mearsheimer. The U.S. should be um, doing things to contain China. And is he he focuses a lot on uh, the rise of China and what, what the U.S. should be doing in terms of uh, China's rise. And then with, as you mentioned before, with modernization theory, uh, Mearsheimer is critical, critical of this U.S. concept because the thinking in the U.S. was that so long as the U.S. engaged China economically, that this would result in China becoming a democracy. Mearsheimer thinks like, you know, that was ridiculous, that the more wealth the Chinese government accumulates, the more power it will seek internationally. Um, and so, you know, we, those who in the 1990s argued that uh, in the U.S., as long as the U.S. engaged in China with trade, uh, that, would be, that China would become a democracy. Um, they've since like, said like, you know, how, how wrong they were. Okay, so Mearsheimer's main criticisms regarding the liberal international order. Liberal democracy is not the only game in town. Remember, before we talked about during the 1990s, in the West, liberal democracy being viewed as the only game in town. Um, as we've seen since 2004, with the decline in global freedom consistently going down uh, every year since 2004, that's clear that authoritarianism or non-democracies are on the rise. His main criticism of the U.S. always being at, at war, the forever wars, in Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, and then in, uh, the U.S. having bad relations, not good relations with other major powers due to its foreign policy. For, so, for example, NATO expansion. Uh, Mearsheim are very critical of that, arguing that, uh, that NATO expansion was obviously going to upset Russia. Um, and so the U.S. should not have engaged in that. And then with the expansion of IOs, um, this results in people like say, in the U.K., for example, with Brexit feeling that their sovereignty is at stake, that they're losing their sovereignty um, because of this international organization. Uh, so Mearsheimer, very critical of the LIO regarding these concepts here. So Mearsheimer's take that in the years to come, that it will go back to something like what we saw during the Cold War. Um, and he argues that there will be these three orders that we will see in the years to come. One is, is a realist 
international order, like things like with the nuclear non-proliferation regime, uh, the International Energy Association. So in terms of like dealing with uh, realist issues, what he argues. He argues that there's going to be this Chinese-led order based on how the Chinese government wants the order to be. And then there will be this competing U.S.-led order. So for Mearsheimer, these will be the three international orders, three systems uh, that we will see in the years to come. And so in terms of the U.S. and Chinese-led Chinese -led orders, um, both orders will seek to have states going into their orbit. Um, and so like people who are, are proponents of this would say that we see this with the Solomon Islands, how recently Chinese government and the Solomon Islands signed a security alliance. Um, so we see here the Chinese government seeking to pull countries into its security orbit. Okay. Um, yeah, and then other states, he, Mearsheimer argues that states always choose security over economic gains. And so ultimately it will be about how that state views its security. Does that state want to align with the U.S. or, or China? For Mearsheimer, it's not going to be about economic gains. Instead, it's going to be about which state do I want to side with based on my security objectives, my security interests. Okay, so I thank you all for your attention, and I welcome any questions or feedback regarding that. If anyone is still here. Um, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, my name is Laura. Laura, I, I have a question. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. And I have a question. So I, I know you teach in Kazakhstan, in Almaty. So uh, and uh, maybe a lot of your students must be Kazakhstani. So what is the what is the role of uh, Kazakhstan? In, in the liberal international order. And uh, th thank you for your kind words and for your question, Laura. I appreciate. It. So regarding Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan embraces a multi-vector foreign policy. A lot of Central Central Asian states do this also, seeking to maximize what they can by playing one country off another, and so you know, like. Kazakhstan government seeking to engage China on economic issues, Russia on security issues, seeing what it can max, and then in terms of leveraging what it can <clears throat> out of the competing powers like the US, China, Russia, EU, Turkey. Um, so Kazakhstan, a non democracy. Um, so it's involved like WTO member. So as we mentioned before, Eikenberry viewing. The liberal international order as a shopping mall that you can go, you can be part of certain institutions, not part of others. You could join this institution, not join this other one. So we see. So overall, uh, Kazakhstan, because it's it's a non democracy, uh, not being say, like in the same campus, so like in like Western states, in terms of its involvement in the liberal international order, but it's not in the position to contest the liberal international order, because as we mentioned before, it would be very costly to try to change, to try to fundamentally change the current international system. And Kazakhstan is in no position to do that. Okay, so my, my colleague and friend, uh, Nadim, oh, okay. Was is there any a perspective for Central, is there any perspective for Central Asia to join the liberal international order in the near future? Is there any possibility to do that? Okay, so in terms okay, so in terms of democracies, I mean Kyrgyzstan. So of the five Central Asian countries, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan is the only one that's somewhat regarded as a democracy. Um, I mean, all these countries in Central Asia have joined 
the international in various international human rights treaties, uh, I see, I, international covenant on civil and political rights, international covenant on economic, social, I can't remember the names of these, um, but they've all joined various human rights uh, covenants, um, but they have a very poor practice in terms of human rights uh, in their countries. So they're not contesting the system because they're not in the position to contest the system. I mean, they're seeking to maximize their gains, as I mentioned before, with this multi-vector foreign policy. But they're not in a position to actively seek to overturn uh, these international institutions because they, they don't have the means to do so. Um, but they're engaging in other, like say in the 2000s, and if you're interested in this book, I mean, if you're interested in this topic, there's a very good book by a um, person who teaches at Columbia. Uh, his name is Alexander Cooley. Alexander Cooley. Um, he wrote the book, uh, Great Games, Local Rules, in which he focuses on how the three main powers I mentioned before, China, Russia, and U.S., engaging in Central Asian states in the 2000s, but because, and because of the effectiveness of these Central Asian states in playing each country off one another, that the U.S., China, and Russia went along with what these Central Asian states wanted in terms of like being okay with this crackdown on human rights, um, being okay with giving into corruption and providing these contracts in which they were the leaders of these countries were just pocketing the money. So these Central Asian countries have been effective in getting what they want from external powers, uh, but they're not on a bid to overturn the system because they're just not in that position uh, to do so. And then in the, um, in the chat, uh, my friend Nadim mentions, there's a lot here. And then, uh, so, um, it, so uh, I would say if you prefer. Okay, yes, Nadim, go ahead, okay, please. If you prefer. So Chris, uh, yeah. thanks first of all for a most stimulating discussion. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Now, in 1919, 1945, and 1989, the hegemon uh, remained the victor post-event. By contrast, on this occasion in 2022, it is conceivable that the United States could be seen as a declining great power and China as a rising great power so that post defeat of Russia, isolation of Russia, sanctioning of Russia, the erstwhile hegemon may not remain the hegemon post-event. If so, where does that leave ILO? And does then realism provide a better basis for understanding the new emerging world order? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, th thank you, Nadim. Yes. So, as mentioned before, democracy is a key component of the liberal international order. And if the world's hegemon is not a democracy, it's going to be very difficult for this term to still be used, the liberal international order, because the world is led by a non-democracy. So it's like, how do you have, they'd have I mean, in terms of economics, in terms of like the World Trade Organization, you know, we can still refer to that as uh, a liberal entity, a liberal institution. Uh, but politically, though, it'd be very difficult uh, to make the case that the liberal international order is still in existence. And in terms of hegemon, I mean, some argue that the U.S. is no longer the world's hegemon, that uh, we're in this era in which like a post-hegemonic order, uh, in which like there is there's no longer a, a hegemon. Uh, instead, power is being dispersed. Um, and like, you know, the U.S. clearly does not have the power now that did like like it did in the 1990s. And so numerous scholars have argued that the U.S. is no longer uh, the world's hegemon. Uh, instead, there are numerous uh, major powers uh, competing for influence. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Nidhi. Does it, uh, Daniel? I see you've got the webcam on. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah. First of all, thanks, uh, Dr. Premiana, for such a, a good presentation. Yes. No, no need to call me Dr. Premier. Uh, so, okay, so, okay. 
that's the official meeting that's why um so um my question was so um in the current situation um um when uh, firstly a lot of the liberal countries and especially america considered that uh free trade uh means uh the empowerment of people in this in the field of human rights and so so if countries have free trade then the country become democracies for uh some after the some period of time uh for china uh it didn't it partially worked but it, it wasn't just the result as america expected for uh, uh the central asia for the arab countries the result is absolutely the same so may we assume that the international trade and the liberalization of trade is not just enough and some uh, additional measures should be uh, used by the liberal international order to uh, maintain its uh, hegemony. Okay, uh, thank you, Daniel. So it would depend on, you know, which IR theory one ascribes to. Uh, because, you know, you mentioned about like, should measures be taken? Uh, I mean, realists would say that, look, if you're engaging in democracy promotion, this is not going to go well. That, uh, you know, don't don't do that. This, these are stupid things, realists would say, like democracy promotion. Uh, instead, like for realists, like values should not be a part of a country's foreign policy. For liberals, values should be a part of a country's foreign policy. So for liberals, so yeah, so it really depends on like, you know, this liberal realist uh, distinction. Liberals would say that, you know, foreign policy should be uh, engaging other states, trying to like name and shame other states, calling out other states' uh, human rights abuses. Um, whereas realists would say, do not get involved with that because that's just not what foreign policy should be about. It should be about power, power politics. So it really depends on which IR theory one ascribes to regarding that. Um, but in terms of modernization theory, yeah, that in the 1990s, you know, but the heyday of the liberal international order, thinking that, you know, so long as the U.S. Uh, engages uh, countries and China in particular uh, with trade, that this is going to result in democracy spreading. Um, you know, we have not seen that. And since 2004, as I mentioned before, um, we've seen this global decline in, uh, in the level of freedom globally. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. So Other people. Have have a thank you. Session for the Q and A. So before asking the questions, would you please do a very brief self introduction? So uh, I saw Professor Wang Wang Haiyan. So you have some questions for uh, Professor Premiana. Uh huh. Thank you. Thank you so much for your speech. Uh, uh, my question is, at uh, present, China and the United States have differences in many aspects. Do you think China and the United States have common needs for cooperation in Central Asia? Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Professor Wang. I think we spoke a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, in ter- I mean, in terms of um, in, so in the two thousands, uh, the U.S. Ch- U.S. and China wanting there to be stability in Central Asia, uh, and so like in two thousand two, I think it was that's when the U.S. Uh, U.S. State Department agreed to list um, I think it was the East Turkestan Islamic Movement (ETIM) as a terrorist organization. Um, so we see there that in the early 2000s, um, that both countries uh, viewing Central Asia through the prism of security as opposed to democracy promotion, um, which in the 1990s, the focus of the U.S. was democracy promotion. Um, but then in the 1990s, excuse me, in the 2000s, after 9 11, the U.S. prioritizing uh, security interests in Central Asia. And so I, mean, I do think that there are numerous areas where the, U- where the U.S. and China can cooperate, uh, specifically in Central Asia, on security matters, 
Um, but, you know, due, due to a number of, of factors, like the U.S. does not want any other country passing the U.S. up uh, in terms of being the next hegemon. Um, and then also in terms of regime type, as mentioned before, uh, like, you know, U.S. democracy. And I should just be clear, when I'm saying the word democracy, I'm referring to electoral democracy and participatory democracy. Because I taught at uh, Ningbo Nording Han, and one of my students, he said to me, I was just mentioning in passing that China is a non-democracy, he raised his hand and said, but Chris, China is a democracy. And so I said, well, what's your definition of democracy? And he said, well, democracy is about economic development. And so I said, well, if your definition of democracy is about economic development, then, then yeah, you can make the argument that China is a democracy. But if it's about like electoral democracy, participatory democracy, it's it's difficult to make the case. Um, but so, so yeah, so, and also in terms of, uh, there's a very interesting book um, called uh, was it the, the Anglosphere, uh, focusing on why the UK was okay with the US passing up, the U, why the UK was okay with the US passing it up as the world's hegemon in that race was the key factor. That's both these countries, uh, white countries, and so in terms of there are numerous reasons for why the U.S. Uh, is, w- w- is very resistant to seeing China uh, passing the U.S. up. Um, so there are areas for cooperation, but there are certainly many areas of, of conflict between the U.S. and China. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Wang. Chris, if I could raise another question, if there's another one. By the way, to introduce myself, I'm Nadeem Nakvi, uh, a professor of economics at Kimep University. Now, typically, a great power should not want its enemies to become close friends. And given that Trump had alienated, President Trump had alienated China, Uh, Was it really smart for President Biden to alienate Russia, furthering a closer and tighter relationship between two adversaries, the great nuclear power, a rival to the United States, namely the Russian Federation, and a great rising economic power, namely China? Could you comment on that, if you would, please? Sure. And just to put that into context, you you probably remember, uh, I was thinking with your question, Nadeem, I was thinking about Nixon's trip to China in 1971. Uh, trying to drive a wedge between China and the Soviet Union um, and getting China on the U.S.'s side um, in this, because the U.S. at that point viewed uh, the USSR as more of a threat um, than, than China. And so regarding Biden, I would say, again, getting back to international relations theory, that it seems to me that liberal IR is really engaging Biden's foreign policy decision-making. It seems like there are more people around him in terms of foreign policy um, advisors who are more liberals than realists. Like if we take, if we compare, so even though he was vice, even though Biden was vice president for Barack Obama, I would say in certain areas, we see Obama embracing more of a realist foreign policy than Biden. Because when Russia invaded Ukraine when Russia seized Crimea. Obama did not supply arms to Ukraine. Supplying arms to Ukraine started under Trump and then escalated under Biden. And so in terms of, I would, yeah, I would say that for, for Biden, we see much more of liberal IR. And then as mentioned before, like liberal IR about values. So this is in terms of like spreading uh, this idea of democracies being united. And so, so for Biden, for his foreign policy advisors, it seems that they've calculated that they're going to have this like alliance of democracies uh, and take on non-democracies um, and then having this confrontation with Russia and China. Um, and so whereas a realist foreign policy, as, as, uh, as you were alluding to, would have sought to prevent <clears throat> those two to prevent China and Russia 
uh, from advancing their relations, instead of trying to dry, drive a wedge between them, um, a realist foreign policy would seek to do that. But would you then say uh, that uh, ILO theorists and President Biden are more in the tradition of warm-hearted and soft-headed? Well, uh, it's so. I mean, I, it depends. I mean, say for so, for example, like. In, in terms of like going to war, you know, like liberals would say that wars to advance human rights, that those are the wars that are just wars. Whereas realists would say that wars to advance national interest, national power, those are the just wars. So it's a very different outlook. Um, whereas in terms of like, you know, how war is justified for liberals, it's justified to advance human rights. Uh, for realists, it's justified to advance the national interest. So it really, it really depends on which IR theory one ascribes to. Okay, thank you.